Great. It's, it's great to see you both in the same room. And uh, so we're very pleased to have with us reporting uh, uh, to us from Lebanon, the UN Special Coordinator for Lebanon, Janine hennis Plushet, And uh, sitting next to her is the UN Humanitarian Coordinator for Lebanon, Imran Riza. And uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for your opening remarks. Uh, I think uh, Ms. hennis Plushet first, and then uh, Mr. Riza, and then we'll turn over to questions. I thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it has been one year, um, one year since the cessation of hostilities across the Blue Line gave way to near daily exchanges of fire. Exchanges of fire that ticked upwards in skill and scope. One year of warnings that the violence between Lebanon and Israel, as bad as it was, would only escalate into something much worse, if not urgently addressed. And tragically, this is exactly what has transpired. In late September, unwritten rules related to mutual deterrence, a world of unstable equations of power and self-declared red lines simply evaporated um, as violence spiraled out of control. And today, Lebanon finds itself facing a conflict and a humanitarian crisis of catastrophic proportions. Now, as you know, this afternoon we are connecting from Beirut, and I can tell you without reservation that the situation is dire. Unrelenting bombardment is now part and parcel of daily life in Lebanon with the latest blasts not even 30 minutes ago. Far too many people are paying an unimaginable price with over 2,000 killed, many more wounded, and hundreds of thousands displaced. In just over one week, we saw the death toll of the month-long 2006 war surpassed. And in a moment, indeed, my colleague Imran will speak more about the devastating humanitarian consequences and ongoing efforts to respond to exponentially growing needs. Hezbollah, meanwhile, continues to launch rockets and missiles into Israel, preventing tens of thousands of Israelis from returning home. Now it is clear that 7 October changed everything, including the threat perception in Israel. But what I want to stress today is that a continuation of the death and destruction we have seen so far will not, cannot, bring about safety or security. Yes, of course, it might lead to short-term tactical wins, but longer-term strategic gains will remain elusive. It is quite simple. The machinery of war does not and cannot address the underlying issues. Perhaps, you know, these issues can be best summarized as a complex interplay of security sovereignty and territorial concerns. Now also, as history, including recent history, has shown us, violence only beckets more violence. So the question then is, what can work? Now firstly, there must be an immediate ceasefire or a pause to start with. This is the only way to ease the colossal human suffering that is happening right now. Importantly, a ceasefire or pause can also provide a window and thus some vital breathing room for diplomatic efforts to take hold and succeed. A rational discussion will not take place under fire. And let me once again express hope that Israel too will now be ready to add its support to the many calls and appeals that are out there. Also, it is incumbent on all of us, including member states, to redouble efforts and leverage every ounce of influence we have. That is to utilize a window without further delay. Secondly, we need a realistic roadmap for the implementation by both sides of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701 and this must include clear implementation and enforcement mechanisms. At the end of the day, it is the lack or non-implementation even of Resolution 1701 over the past 18 years that led to today's harsh reality. And thirdly, in parallel, we need to see the Lebanese state come back into the equation. The government has been vocal in its support for a ceasefire and the Lebanese government has indeed voiced its commitment to the full implementation of Resolution 1701, and rightly so. But I cannot overstate 
a united, empowered and equipped Lebanese state will prove critical. Now, in conclusion, people on both sides of the blue line are suffering. In Lebanon, people are dying, displaced or living in a state of all-consuming fear. Citizens in northern Israel also fear for their safety, still yearning to go home one year on from the horrific October 7 attack. Meanwhile, people across the region and the wider world are holding their breath, warning of the disastrous consequences of an even greater regional conflagration. Now, clearly, these times are not normal. The situation is scary, scary and unsettling, and we cannot become desensitized. We cannot accept this as the new normal. To do so risks sleepwalking into the abyss. In other words, fire must cease. We need a window and we need it now. We need a path back to the negotiation table, a table where the interests of all parties can be aired and considered, where sustainable solutions can be found and agreed upon. Again, the time to cease fire is now too much. Is at stake to do anything Less. Thank you. Thank you. Imran? Yeah, thank you, Farhan. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, over the past year, the escalation of hostilities has inflicted severe damage on communities in southern Lebanon. In just the last three weeks, the violence has intensified, as you know, causing widespread civilian casualties, mass displacement, and extensive destruction across the country, marking one of the deadliest periods in Lebanon's recent history. For the Lebanese, this conflict also brings back painful memories of past crises. For Palestine and Syrian refugees in Lebanon, it serves as a stark reminder of the devastation they have experienced in their own lands. And for the migrant workers left stranded right now, it brings uncertainty and insecurity. Everyone is caught between a history of suffering and a present where Lebanon follows another tragic path. More than 2,000 people have been killed in the last year, as Janine was just saying, including at least 100 children and 300 women. At least 1 million people have been directly affected, many of them displaced, often multiple times, enduring the loss of loved ones, homes, livelihoods, and their sense of security. More than 600,000 people are internally displaced across the country, over half of them women and girls. At least 350,000 children have been displaced in total. The toll of the conflict on children, most of whom are also out of school, with the start of the new year, year postponed to the 4th of November, as 75% of the country's public schools have been, have been converted into shelters. So the impact of the conflict on children is immense. At least 185,000 people have sought refuge in a approximately 1,000 shelters right now today, 80% um, of which are already fully at capacity. Meanwhile, thousands of others displaced by orders issued with little notice and often past midnight are left to sleep on the streets or not really know where to go. And over 300,000 people have fled to neighboring countries, um, crossing over to Syria and many of them moving on to Iraq or Turkey as well. Healthcare and frontline workers have come under attack, as have civil defense centers and water supply systems, pushing essential services to the brink of collapse. The killing of over 100 paramedics healthcare workers and public servants impairs Lebanon's emergency response capacity. This must stop. Even wars have rules. We urge all parties to uphold their obligations under international humanitarian law and protect civilians and civilian infrastructure. Objects indispensable for civilian survival must be spared. The United Nations and partners are providing assistance to those in need in coordination with ministries, with the government and local organizations. In addition to providing critical aid to the displaced, we are also working diligently to access 
hard to reach areas to assist civilians in need that are remaining there. Um, just last Saturday, we had the first convoy going down to Tier with much needed um, relief supplies. It was done by WFP, UNICEF, OCHA, the Sovereign Order of Malta and, and uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council together. Um, and we hope to do many, many more of these. Many of our national colleagues are themselves displaced or hosting their extended families while remaining committed to helping in these challenging times. We urge all parties to protect humanitarians and facilitate their work, our work, and to protect civilians as they access aid and shelter. Last week, we, we launched a flat appeal um, of $426 million to address these escalating needs. New pledges are being announced, but remain as insufficient for the scale of the need. Um, and more aid is certainly urgently required. However, resolving this crisis will not be achieved through humanitarian action. I think we all know that. It requires concerted influence to ensure respect for international humanitarian law, as well as a robust political diplomatic process leading to a lasting ceasefire. Without it, the suffering will only deepen and spread the international community must act now to prevent further suffering. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for your presentations. I'm now going to open up the floor for questions. Uh, first question, Margaret. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's Margaret Bashir from Voice of America. Thank you both for the briefing and taking time out of a really busy day. Um, I just want to ask you, um, Mrs. Uh, Plesher, what do you think of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's video yesterday, it sounded rather ominous, telling the Lebanese they had a choice to either basically get rid of Hezbollah or see a longer war. Um, how is that being received in Lebanon? And realistically, I know there's a big push to get a president in place, but realistically, that's not a silver bullet um, to fix the situation. Where do you see these discussions going, and, and what's your realistic hope for them. Thank you. Um, with regards to the video, let me not give, I mean, my opinion really is not very relevant, but it has not, um, here on the ground, it was not perceived with open arms, as you may imagine, um, because as you rightly pointed out, many people here described it as ominous and considered it a threat. Um, on the presidency in Lebanon, I mean, as you know, there has been no president for two years now. And the president is not a silver bullet for all the problems in the country. But if I talk about bringing the state back into the equation, I can only say, um, uh, or not overstate really, that the president um, is critical and essential. So we truly hope that parties will now, now overcome or bridge their differences and come together and um, go ahead with the elections. That is ASAP, um, because the country, in absence of, absence of a president, although not a silver bullet, but will only become more vulnerable. Can I just uh, follow that up a second? Okay, back to the video just for one minute. You're calling for an immediate ceasefire or a pause. So does the tone of that video give you any reason to hope that from the Israeli side, they would accept that. Let me just refer to what I just said. I express hope that Israel uh, will now or soon be ready to add its support to the many um, calls and appeals out there. Uh, a ceasefire or a pause, a window, no matter how <laughs> we are going to frame it, but uh, we need a period of calm to bring parties to the negotiating table and to find uh, and agree upon uh, sustainable solutions. I'm not saying that it's going to be an easy ride or a walk in a park. It will be uh, difficult, but I am convinced that it's doable and it's in the interest of Lebanon, in the interest of Israel, um, um, to find sustainable solutions rather than a situation uh, that we can best describe as history will repeat itself. Tactical wins do not add up to a solid strategy. Esther? 
Thank you both um, so much. This is Augusta Sarajevo with Bloomberg News. I actually have a couple of questions. So you talked a little bit about the need for a realistic roadmap and some enforcement enforcement mechanisms when it comes to 1701. Could you please give us some more details of what that would look like ideally? And then as things get more tense in Lebanon, how concerned are you about civil unrest at this point? Thank you. Uh, on the implementation and enforcement mechanisms, these discussions are now ongoing, um, but clearly um, with two parties not implementing Resolution 1701 for 18 years and both parties complaining about it, we will now need to look into what are the mechanisms and there surely are mechanisms so that we can actually make sure that the resolution will be implemented rather than, you know, a lot, uh, lots of beautiful speeches about commitments and uh, not doing it. So um, uh, the discussion on what exactly the implementation and enforcement mechanisms could entail, um, they are ongoing. At the end of the day, it's also up to the Security Council, of course, because it will need to be included in uh, any uh, mandate. Um, on the issue of civil unrest, it's something that we are closely monitoring um, because, I mean, you are well aware of uh, Lebanon's history, so the risk of civil unrest is there. Right now, all parties come together and address uh, their constituents uh, with the right messages, uh, but it doesn't mean that the risk um, uh, can be ignored. So we are monitoring and continue to call on all um, to, um, like I said, to, to bring back the state into the equation, to empower and equip the state, but also to unite in the interests of Lebanon, no matter what background affiliation, and importantly, not at the expense of one or another party. Nabil? Thank you, Nabil Abisab, Al Arabi TV station. Uh, Mrs. Blaskart, uh, we heard uh, uh, a few days ago a joint statement uh, from uh, Mr. Speaker Birri and uh, the Prime Minister and Mr. Jumblat that it could be maybe a, a kind of a roadmap. Uh, do, do you think it has a chance to fly? What do you think about this uh, position or statement? And do you have any indication that Hezbollah could maybe join this position? We heard a different, completely different position from the Iranian foreign minister, for example, about it. And my second question, after one year of the war in Gaza, and we hear a lot of, 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 of like maybe concerns that Lebanon could become a second Gaza. What do you think are like the main lessons learned in the UN system that you can avoid maybe in the, in, in the situation in Lebanon now that it doesn't take another year or more of another war. Thank you. Um, to, um, um, coming back to your question on the Prime Minister Speaker and um, uh, Mr. Jimblad is, I mean, of course, we welcome this kind of statements because it shows that the country actually unites and tries um, jointly and collectively to find solutions um, for a sustainable way out of, uh, of this uh, uh, nightmare. Uh, but again, it's not only up to Lebanon, it's, there's another party on the other side, and that is Israel, and we need both uh, countries to um, uh, voice support for any ceasefire or window to actually address what leaders are uh, voicing here in country on what a potential way forward could be. Then on um, uh, Lebanon and um, the risk of becoming a second Gaza, uh, perhaps Imran would like to comment uh, as well. But in terms of UN system, I don't think I'm the best place to comment on the entire UN system. Uh, but what I do know is that we, of course, um, need a UN Security Council that is crystal clear on what it finds acceptable um, if we talk about international humanitarian law and other issues such as the protection of civilians. Um, and here um, the UN Secretariat can do as much. Um, at the end of the day, the entire system must work. And I think it's not um, difficult to conclude that in the case, case of Gaza, we missed multiple opportunities. I we also ask say, about Hezbollah, if you have any indications about Hezbollah's position. I cannot speak on behalf of Hezbollah, um, but what I do know, as you know, 
is that um, it is relevant for any solution that it has the buy-in of all actors, including Hezbollah. Um, if I can just add to the Gaza um, answer that, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right to ask that, I think, because um, the trauma, the fear, the anxiety here is is very much about how that whether whether we go on that route, whether that's where it's going right now. And you were asking about lessons. The lessons are to have member states really exert everything they can. Um, on the one hand, towards the ceasefire that, that the special coordinator has just been talking about, uh, but in the meantime, respecting international humanitarian law, respecting protection of civilians, respecting uh, protecting humanitarian workers, frontline workers, and, and the like. And that is what we really need at this time. Okay. Michelle? Thank you. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Um, just to follow up. Uh, first on Maggie's question, do you plan to sort of formally propose ways to bolster 1701 to the Security Council? Um, and then in terms of a ceasefire, um, are you, have you seen any indication that there is any kind of deal sort of still on the table or any real viable diplomatic track at the moment? You know, we haven't really heard a lot, as you say, beyond calls since the US-French proposal a few weeks ago. Um, so if you've got any detail on that, that'd be great. Well, to start with um, uh, the second question, um, the joint call for a 21-day ceasefire as launched by the US or led by the US and France, I think is still on the table and very relevant. Um, so we should not dismiss it. Um, I don't think that new uh, initiatives will add to it. I mean, the many uh, appeals and calls for ceasefire are crystal clear. We need a window for diplomatic efforts to succeed. Um, on the implementation and enforcement mechanisms, as I said, um, conversations are ongoing. But again, <laughs> for that to materialize, we will need to have that window. Um, because it has to be uh, an enforcement and uh, implementation mechanism or multiple mechanisms that both parties can agree upon. Um, the good news is that um, both parties, although they are not necessarily in agreement on the ceasefire, that they do uh, still refer to the necessity of fully implementing Resolution 1701. Thanks. Uh, Pam? Uh, thanks to both of our briefers. It's Pamela Falk from U.S. News and World Report. Can you clarify, uh, I think it was in Nabil's question and in some of the questions, do you think the way forward is 1701 right now, or is it too late for that and something else should be uh, prove, um, adopted by the Security Council? It has been 18 years, and uh, obviously a lot of... Um, non-compliance. Thank you. Well, it, if you allow me, the, the 1701 resolution is still very relevant and still very, I mean, nobody's questioning the validity, validity of the provisions in 1701. Um, so it's still a framework that both parties could work with and actually agree on. The question is not whether 1701 is still relevant. The question is, uh, how to implement it and how come it was not implemented in the past 18 years. And therefore, I am um, uh, pushing or hinting or suggesting that a serious discussion on implementation and enforcement mechanisms will uh, take place because otherwise, even if there would be a ceasefire and we would agree on the full implementation of 1701, then, I mean, what we would like to avoid is a number of is again a period of relatively calm or a return to the cessation of hostilities. And then after 10, 15, 18 years, we have a similar situation as we are facing today. So the implementation, it's not, again, it's not whether this, the resolution is not relevant, it is. Um, nobody is actually questioning the validity of the provisions, but it's all about um, the political will as well to implement the provisions of 17 uh, own. And whether the Security Council would like to move ahead with, you know, a different kind of resolution or amend the resolution, that, of course, is entirely up to the Security Council. 
I can only give you, you know, the insights that we have here on the ground and what we think is necessary. Okay, thanks. Um, Tony? Thank you, Tony Nadaf, Al Hurra TV. Thank you for your briefing. My question is to Mr. Riza. Uh, can you give us a little bit more information on the situation of the health sector, specifically in the southern of uh, Lebanon? We're hearing and receiving reports on a lot of shutting down due to damage. And uh, also, I want to talk up with you about the um, educational system. 75% of the 978 shelters are in public schools, as you just mentioned. And also we heard the Ministry of Education and Higher Education in Lebanon announced that public schools, um, they're going to push or delay the school year to November 4, which means if the war continues, are we nearing a total cancellation of the, the, the school year? Or what's, what's the plan here? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, because it also, I mean, the, the way we're approaching this is obviously together with the government and trying to find out what we can do at this point. Um, I think all of us saw over the last few weeks um, just how, I mean, to me, the word is valiant. The health sector was in dealing with the challenges that they faced. They were, they were just uh, immense, immense, uh, way beyond any expectation of what we would be seeing in terms of casualties and what hospitals and primary health care centers have to do. And they did it with very little, very little supplies. Now we're seeing the supplies coming. So on the health sector, uh, on the one hand, we will be getting, I think, some of what we need. The UAE and Qatar have both started more or less air bridges. Um, and bringing in in-kind donations. We've heard of others also coming with that. So supplies are there, but the supplies are not enough. Um, we need to protect the health facilities and the health workers. And, and you were rightly talking about the South, where we've had a lot of health, health facilities, not only in the South, but in other parts of, of um, Lebanon as well. So it goes back to that basic, basic message about international humanitarian law and protecting civilians and protecting civilian infrastructure and 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 uh, on children are bearing the brunt uh, um, it, it, and and it's not just the displacement which is huge but it is about education and at the moment I think it was two days ago that the government announced that it would be the 4th of November for public schools to open and we're currently trying to see what we can do um, collectively to try to ensure that there are different forms of education online otherwise also to try to ensure that there is a school year but uh, that's not a given um, and that's why we've had to postpone it why the government has had to postpone it um, more than it should they should have been open already um, we will look at i mean it, it relates also what what else can we do about shelter what else can we use so we're going to try and find um, alternatives in order to try to preserve um, this school year that's coming up okay uh, abdul hamid online Thank you, Farhan. Uh, this is Abdul Hamid Sayam from the Arabic Daily Al Quds Al Arabi. And this question is addressed to both uh, uh, briefers. Uh, I want to ask you if you know that Lebanon's sovereignty was respected before October 7th, and only violation of this sovereignty came after uh, October 7th. As far as I know, there are at least 200 times a year, Lebanon's sovereignty was uh, violated by Israel before. And my second question, do you admit there are, there are some Lebanese land still occupied by Israel? I want to draw your attention to uh, the Shagar uh, village and Shab'a farm, still controlled by Israel. So the people of Lebanon has the right to resist occupation. And Finally, why, when U.S., France, Germany, U.K. come to help Israel, there's silence. But when some come, uh, an Arab country or Arab non-state actor come to help the Palestinian, uh, then there will be an outcry. Thank you. So on the violations and um, the disputed territories that you just referred to, um, as I said, um, there was a lack or even non-implementation of a UN Security Council 
Resolution 1701. And so you make a case um, uh, for the implementation of 1701. Violations of the resolution are nothing new. Otherwise, I would not have referred to a lack or even non-implementation of that resolution. Um, and of course, if we talk in terms of uh, implementing the resolution, it goes for both sides. So Lebanon and uh, Israel. Um, I lost track of the second question. I didn't quite get to okay. the second, the second question. I lost track. Sorry for that. Abdelhamid, do you want to repeat your question? The second question, do you admit there is some Lebanese uh, land still occupied by Israel? Uh, yeah, but this is uh, also part of Resolution 1701. So whether we talk about discrete territories or occupied territories um, or violations, um, then it goes for both sides. Uh, so that's why I uh, insist <laughs> there was a lack or even non-implementation in the past 18 years, and it led to the situation that we are in right now. Okay. Uh, Evelyn? Yes, thank you. Evelyn Leopold, um, Globetrotter Media and Pass Blue. Um, could you uh, speak about the dangers to UNIFIL, if there are any still existing? Um, some of the UNIFIL soldiers are from countries, whether it's Italy and others, who either are still supporting Israel or have s supported them in the past. Does that make any difference? Um, if we talk about UNIFIL, of course, I am not the force commander, so it's always a bit risky to start talking about uh, UNIFIL. I think you have been briefed very recently by um, USG Jean-Pierre Lacroix on the situation with UNIFIL. Um, as you know, UNIFIL decided to stay in position to the extent possible, of course, uh, but right now they are in position. The uh, tr troop contributing countries, um, whether they have a certain affiliation or support for any of the parties is really not relevant. Uh, and I don't think that we should go down this path. Any individual participating uh, in this mission, UNIFIL, is giving his or her best for a stable Lebanon and for calm across the blue line. Um, so I think that it is good to emphasize this and to pay respect for those men and, and women serving across the blue line right now. Fino? Thank you. Uh, Stefano Vaccara, La Voce in New York, Italy Press is actually at this point a follow up. There is again a, a about UNIFIL. Um, how should we call those um, peacekeepers that are now there? I mean, peacekeepers doesn't make sense anymore, right? To call them peacekeepers. So would you call them uh, witness to war? Would you call them uh, protector of civilians? But are they really ready to protect civilians if they are called? Now, you can tell me, I'll ask this question to Lacroix or others, I did. I just would like to know also your opinion on what is really the situation and what those uh, um, blue helmets can actually do and not do there. Well, I think you're familiar with the mandate of UNIFIL and what they can do and cannot do. I think it's not the time to have a semantic discussion on whether we should refer to uh, peacekeeping or not. Uh, I think it is time for all of us to pay respect to those men and, and women uh, serving in the south of Lebanon. And that goes, by the way, also for our humanitarian colleagues. What I do know is that UNIFIL is um, doing its utmost to um, work with our humanitarian colleagues, for instance, to get a certain goods at a certain destination. Um, and that uh, so they facilitate a lot. They have an important um, liaison function. Um, and secondly, also in terms of you know uh, protecting civilians, they have a role to play. Uh, if, for instance, civilians need a safe way uh, out of their villages after uh, the evacuation request from the Israeli. So again, I um, you know I, I was a former defense. I am a former defense minister. So it's uh, I don't uh, I find it quite uh, interesting that people question 
uh, a peacekeeping mission at this uh, stage. They are doing under very difficult circumstances their very best. Uh, and again, I wish to pay respect for those men and women serving. If, if I may, on it, um, just the protection of civilians bit, because you brought that up. Um, we have set up a civil military coordination unit, and, and that is quite central to ensuring that humanitarians can move um, in the area, um, not with military escorts, but as humanitarians moving on it. But that takes liaison, it takes uh, the presence and, and working together. And UNIFIL has been crucial for, for us in, in being able to, what I referred to the other day, uh, just, I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> the other day, just before, um, about um, the convoy we did to Tiet. Um, just the other day, also, we had uh, about a thousand people that were evacuated from a village called Ainebel in the south by the Order of Malta, who organized it. But the whole coordination, the deconfliction, the notification on all of this is um, very much something that's part of UNIFIL's trying to help with protection of civilians, that mandate that they have. I'm sorry, I, I need to follow up here. There is no uh, doubt that, I mean, I'm, I don't think anybody here uh, doesn't respect the work there at the moment in these very difficult circumstances those uh, blue helmets are doing. This, there is, but the point is that we are having report that they are in the middle or two uh, part fighting. This is not very unusual in the history of the UN. Eight times yeah, in the history of the UN that, uh, that peacekeepers have been caught up in fighting. Yeah, if you if look at the history of the UN. Up, yeah, well, then I will say if they caught up, not if they knew before that, they, that this was going to happen when the country, the Israeli government, the Secretary General say that the Israeli government asked to Secretary General Guterres to move at least partially them, and they were not moved. So it's a different circumstance, I think. So my question was, in reality, is how, we, how the UN, and you are part of the UN, how the UN <laughs> is assuring that those 10,000 blue helmets are not somehow, some way, become targets of the two parts that are in war. So, because nobody is understanding this, because they are in the middle. Yesterday, there was a question to the down to Secretary uh, uh, Guterres about the Irish soldiers that were with in front of them, uh, uh, tanks, uh, Israeli tanks. So that's what what my question was. No, I was not putting in the, any. Okay. Uh, 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 Stefano, because we have limited time, I, I just. Uh, uh, again, this is not an, uh, unusual for UN peacekeeping. And I would uh, say, uh, if you look back at uh, what happened in 2006, it's not even the first time uh, that you've had this sort of situation happening to UN peacekeeping in Lebanon. So I'd, I'd just ask you to look back at that record. Uh, we, we have two more questions to, to wrap up. Oh, yeah. Again, we are not representing here Unifil, the force commander is, and he is right now in the South dealing with all kinds of deconfliction issues. But, the, I mean, the decision by UNIFIL has been aired. It is not unusual. And uh, to the extent possible, they will do what they uh, have to do according and in line with their mandate. Thanks very much. Uh, Sinan? Thank you, Farhan. Uh, my name is Sinan Tunchtemir. I'm with Ruda Media Network. Thank you for the opportunity. I have a question about the Syrian and Lebanese people are crossing the border, going to Syria, Turkey, and Iraq. Uh, the question is, I mean, they have to pass the checkpoint of Syrian government to, in order to get to northeast Syria and Iraq, as well as Turkey. So how difficult is this path? I mean, what kind of safety do you provide those refugees? And given the fact, UN report says, even, I mean, Syria is not safe for even the, its own refugees. And these people are going to Syria. I mean and how safe it is for them going back to Syria, and how difficult it is for you working with Syrian government as well as in northeast Syria with the Kurdish authorities and, and Iraqi authorities. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think we're not really in the place to answer that. It's our colleagues in Syria that are doing that. But what I can tell you is that the High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, was here um, last Sunday. We had a series of meetings with the government here, discussions about that. And if you read about what he's been saying from Syria, 
um, because he proceeded to Syria from, from Lebanon. Um, it's about um, calling for proper assistance, protection, facilitation um, of, of uh, movement for all, all people that are in need in that way. And that's Syrians as well as Lebanese that have crossed over. With, that have crossed, um, over. The majority are, of course, Syrians. Um, what we were looking at from this angle was trying to make sure that there's no there are no obstacles to them leaving if that's what they wanted to do and and uh, on that front um, we know that two very critical elements on it one was that the at the border it was facilitated for people to to cross and the second is that UNHCR got got, got good access to monitor what was happening with people that were crossing and to be able to assist them. Okay. Uh, last question, Maggie. Uh, hi, it's Margaret Bashir again from VOA. Uh, Mr. Riza, just a couple follow-ups to you, please. Um, since so much of the housing in the south of Lebanon and in Dahye have been destroyed now in the last two weeks, it seems to me that these people will be staying in the shelters, the school shelters, for very long. So if school's going to start on November 4th, realistically, uh, where is it going to start? Because people will still be living in the schools. And where will the displaced children go to schools? Maybe there's schools in other communities that are available for kids, but in the ones where they're um, still being shelters, where do you see them going to school? And are you working with the government and the Ministry of Education on it? And just secondly, um, you talked about a little bit about civil and military de uh, coordination. I was just wondering, for people who are trying to leave the country, there have been some uh, governments doing evacuation flights and such. Uh, people are afraid to go to the airport. You know, there's been bombing on some of the roads that lead there, and uh, people are also very concerned that the airport will be a target. It was in 2006. So is there deconfliction going on with Israel to be sure that they will not strike either the airport or the airport roads? Thank you. Maybe let's start with the last one first on the airport. Okay, so on the um, sorry on the airport, um, Israel uh, made it clear that it's not um, has no intention to um, um, how to say this attack to the airport inoperable. <laughs> yeah, to make the airport inoperable. Uh, what does happen if there is a target in the vicinity of the airport? There can be disruptions. So this is what we're seeing um, at this stage, but um, uh, the airport continues to operate and of course all calls are um, that it should continue to operate. So this, this is the latest, um, no guarantees, uh, I have to say for the future, but right now um, uh, the intentions are to keep a Beirut airport free from, uh, from uh, becoming inoperable. Sorry, did they tell you that? Because I don't think we've read that in the press here. Did they? Did your Israeli interlocutors make that clear to you? I think that it needs to be made clear through many, including um, State Department in the U.S. and others, um, and including through our own contacts with uh, everybody here on the ground and on the other side. Okay. On, on, on the education question, yes, indeed. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why we've got this delay in the opening of the school year for another month, more or less, is to try and see what, what we can do. Um, and so there are discussions going on um, between uh, lots of different government actors, the Ministry of Social Affairs, the Ministry of Education, the uh, Nasser Yassin, Minister Yassin is the overall coordinator um, with the Prime Minister himself. Um, on this to try to find alternatives and more shelter and what we do in this this immediate period. Um, as, as UN agencies, we've got a lot of expertise and, and, and resources that we're hoping to get um, to, to try and help with this, and we have to work quite quite quickly on it. There will be obviously other forms of education that will have to happen um, and there will have to be double shifting we'll have to pick certain schools that we i think tax a lot in terms of that there will be online education there will be every effort made to try to um, minimize uh, the disruption in these children's futures I'd like uh, once more to thank our guests, the UN Special Coordinator for Lebanon, Janine hennis Blashert, and the UN Humanitarian Coordinator for Lebanon, Imran Reza. Thanks very much for, for this briefing, and 
uh, best of luck uh, as, as we do deal with the days ahead. Thank you. Thank, thanks. Have a good afternoon, everyone. It's off because the mic is still on. Okay.